Good evening and welcome to this, the last session of um, the DPU 60 year celebration. It's been a fantastic year. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Julio Davila, director of DPU. Uh, I do see faces that I haven't seen before, so you never know. Um, we have, as I said, the last of what has been an extremely productive year celebrating 60 years of the DPU. Um, a very full, virtually every month we've had something. Um, we launched uh, on in January with a reflection by the research clusters, the four research clusters that are represented today, um, looking at what it is that we do and what are the current challenges. Um, today we'll be doing the same exercise, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it later, uh, about looking forward, looking to the next 60 years, perhaps the next 120 years, who knows how many. Um, we also had uh, a series of lectures and events. Uh, the highlight was perhaps the, oh, definitely the two on a bit days of the DPU 60 conference, which was fantastically well attended with something like 250 people attending. Uh, that was very successful and in many ways it covered really in great depth um, and by pushing the boundaries of knowledge you covered the 60 years that, that we've covered in the DPU um, with an inevitable leaning towards the, the last uh, decade and a half or so. Just for those of you who are not familiar with, with DPU, I'll just give you a very brief history um, which uh, is summarized, oh sorry, not summarized, I'm summarizing it, it's sort of, it, it is detailed in this brochure which um, you can get from the DPU, you can download from the website, called 60 Years of Urban Development, a short history of the development planning unit. It was originally written by Patrick Wakeley when he was director 10 years ago, and my predecessor, and, and my other predecessor, Karen Levy, uh, following on him, uh, updated it with some help from her friends uh, uh, for the last 10 years. So this covers 60 years of DPU's history. Just for those of you who are not familiar with it and who haven't read this, very briefly, the, the uh, DPU was established at the Architectural Association in 1954 um, as the Department of Tropical Architecture. It was uh, a few years later, in 1957, Otto Koenigsberger, later to be Professor Otto Koenigsberger, who had a fantastic um, history of working as a planner and architect in India, was appointed director. He introduced elements of urban planning and particularly low-income housing. Uh, it changed its name in 1968 to the Department of Development and Tropical Studies. So you can see that already the issues of development are starting to sort of seep in. Uh, in 1971, it moved to UCL. So we've been here not this full 60 years. We've been here most of them, but not all of them, uh, to the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And Otto was appointed Professor of Development Planning at the time. Uh, fast forward to 1980, we have the first MSc degree. Up to that point, we had a diploma and short courses. It was very much um, a DPU. DPU was very much oriented towards mid-career professionals, mainly in the Commonwealth, but it was attracting people who were interested in the challenges of dealing with rapid urbanization in Latin America. So there are quite a few Latin Americans present in the 19, uh, late 60s and throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, I came in the early 1980s, I'm not, but that's ancient history. I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, and as, as Pat Wakeley says, Otto Koenigsberger, quote, said that the job of the DPU is to do itself out of a job. And Pat Wakeley added rather wryly, actually, the DPU has done itself out of a job many times, but there is, there is always the next job to do. So uh, that's how we justify our existence. There's an enormous set of challenges that we we face uh, around the urban, and tonight is one of these um, times for reflection, also celebration of the 60 years, and to look forward. So Karen, who's put this uh, series together with the help of Colin and several others who are in the room, um, Karen has given the brief to four of my colleagues who are sitting here, looking rather daunted and uh, <laughs> sheepish, uh, <laughs> Has, who each represent one of the four clusters, research clusters, in which we organize our research work. She has given them the following brief. What has the cluster achieved to date? So in other words, 
are you value for money? Because I pay, we, we give him some money to do some work. So in other words, I want to see whether that money is worth it. Uh, I, don't, I know she didn't mean that, but it's my... Uh, and, and, and what boundaries, what boundaries, you know, because the, the theme of the year is thinking across boundaries. We're crossing boundaries. What are these boundaries? What are, what are these boundaries that we're thinking across? But also the challenge is what are the future directions? What are the future directions of the cluster? What is the theory that is embedded within this? What methodologies with the agency of which organizations? And finally, it's more challenging question, what are the research questions looking forward and why? So this is a daunting task that they have to do, perform in 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, well, we, there will be in the following order, Michael Walls representing the state and market cluster. Cassidy Johnson, uh, who represents the Environmental Justice, Urbanization and Resilience Cluster. Barbara Lieplitz, who uh, represents the Urban Transformations Cluster. And Alex Frediani, who represents the Diversity, Social Complexity and Planned Intervention. But we don't stop there. We have Professor David Simon to come here and, and comment on all this. Uh, as a, not quite an external examiner, but somebody who, who can check, <laughs> who can check whether... <laughs> Exterminator. We, we, who, can, who can check what, what, what we're doing and whether what we're doing is right or not. Uh, David is an old friend of the DPU. He's been fantastically uh, supportive and a close uh, friend, uh, personally and professionally. David is based at Royal Holloway at the University of, of, of London, where he's professor of dual and geography. He's now increasingly seconded to a, a body uh, uh, called Mistra Urban Futures. It's the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Environmental Research, and he's based part of his time in Gothenburg uh, in Sweden. Um, he was head of Department of Geography of Royal Holloway uh, in 2008-2011, uh, and he has worked and produced major work on a number of areas that that all the clusters are touching upon. So he's extremely well qualified to comment on what uh, my colleagues are going to present. So um, without further ado, I um, open the floor, give the floor to Michael. I've only got the, the simple task, as I understand the introduction of being, to uh, justify the existence of the state and market cluster um, that we offer value for money. It sounds very different, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> And to look forward to what we're going to be doing over the next 60 years and possibly 120 years. Well, I, I can tell you from the start that I'm going to fail. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do those things, but hopefully I'm going to be able to give you a bit of a flavour. Um, and I want to start, start actually by making a, a comment that's not in the least bit related to that, which is that um, I found David Simon's work very useful in, in a lot of the teaching I've done in the past. Yesterday I quoted David Simon, but I had to make the point in my class that the David Simon I was talking about was in fact the producer of the TV program The Wire, um, <laughs> who is not the same person, um, just in case you were getting excited and thought that he was going to tell you about policing in Baltimore. Um, but what I want to do with the, the cluster stuff, having already wasted a few minutes of my 10, is to start off by talking about the market, because I think using talking about the market helps me frame, I think, what the cluster is about in terms of thinking about the the state as well, and the different actors and the roles they play. And I want to draw on one of the comments that Colin made in the opening presentation on these clusters, which was that the market is a conception of the world, a very powerful conception, but not the world itself. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in the cluster is interrogate that model, that idea, that conception of how the world works. And like any model, that model is one that reduces many of the important elements to a point where you, of course, get the power of modelling, but you also get the deficiencies of reductionism. Um, I think that reminds me very much of, of a comment uh, from Tandika Makandawire that where he described that idea of modelling society, the world, um, as institutional monocropping where a predominantly Anglo-Saxon conception of institutional arrangements that support market functions um, are imposed on the assumption that they're somehow natural. Of course, that fails to recognise that markets and the roles of different actors, including states, civil society groups and private sector firms and so on, and the rules and norms that mediate their interactions can and do take very different forms in different circumstances, contexts, cultures and spaces. 
From a cluster perspective, that means that we are trying to accomplish something of a double act. That double act is both to recognise the power of the model and to try to understand some of the lessons we can draw from the, from the use of that model, while also looking at the limitations and the existence of an array of alternative approaches that might be useful in trying to perform a more critical engagement and try to understand what that means for development and planned intervention. Um, it's really a process of trying not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but trying to draw many of the value, or some of the value that, that can be had from both the critique and the understanding itself. Of course, that is an impossible task to do. It will be an impossible task in 60 years, just as it has been in the last short period of time since the cluster came into being. The endeavour itself involves the cross of a great many boundaries. Colin identified disciplinary, epistemological and geographical boundaries as some of the important ones we're trying to deal with. He also very importantly made the point that some of the boundaries that we need to challenge, cross, are personal ones. And they're personal ones because of, I think, partly the um, very institutionalised, ingrained um, sense in which these ideas about structures, norms, rules of the game that govern markets are internalised within the way we think um, all not quite nat naturally, but very much in terms of reflective of the, of the backgrounds that many of us come from. So it means questioning a lot of personal values and our personal assumptions, um, challenging those, as well as trying to engage with the, the frameworks and approaches we're, we're dealing with. I've talked mostly about markets so far, and I said that that was the way I wanted to frame the, the, um, the activities of states and other actors. And that's because the narrow notion of markets that I've been describing continues to take, dictate prescriptions for appropriate actions for the different actors in development and planning. Um, it largely, therefore, dictates the debate itself, even though there are critiques, there are voices that are questioning the assumptions that are behind it. I'm, I recall eight years ago, Barbara Harris-White complaining about the early 21st century impoverishment of development which she felt was embodied, I think quite accurately, in the Commissioner for Africa's report, which reduced the task of ta tackling Africa's intractable, uh, excuse me, let me just have a bit of water, intractable poverty to the expansion of business. So her argument was essentially that markets were the uh, mechanism by which um, African poverty was going, to be, was going to be tackled. And we still see that thinking very much in the African rising narrative that is, that, that is so popular today. Um, one of the things that I think um, energises the, the discussions within the cluster is there is some sense that we are at something of a turning point in the, in the discourse. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that turning point, if it turns out to be true, comes about for very practical reasons rather than because of the strength of the arguments that are, are being presented. In a, in a lot of ways, the arguments themselves are no stronger than they have been for a long time. But the practical circumstances that are changing that narrative um, include things like the presence of alternatives in a development industry or market, um, including, for example, the presence of a, an actor like China um, on a development um, stage that allows many countries, nations, states in the global south to look for choices and to adopt negotiating positions which are much more powerful than they were when they only really had one choice in terms of accepting donor money. Um, it's also important to recognise the, the role that the 2008 financial crisis has had in re reframing the question. Now again, I, I, I draw on one of the, the readings that I found useful on this by Peck Theodore on Brenner writing in 2009 about that crisis, where they were musing on the fact that what seemed to be happening in the immediate aftermath of 2008 was not so much a ruptural break with what they described as the neoliberal past, but a reconstruction of the existing policy regime and political relations. In other words, rather um, counterintuitively, what seemed to be a crisis of capitalism, a crisis of that narrow model of markets, seemed to become a reaffirmation of precisely the assumptions and principles of that system. 
But I wonder if we're not at a point where we might see what they describe as a slower death for that set of assumptions, something that might take more years. We might have seen a, a revival in them, but perhaps that's not going to last, and perhaps that's one of the things that feeds in to the sense that we're at a turning point. I haven't actually kept time, so I presume I'm going to run out of time soon, but I need to, I need to in the process of explaining our value for money, talk a little bit, bit about the activities of the cluster. And I want to do that in a way that I think refers both to the past and the future, um, because all of the things that we've been focusing on, well, they don't stop today and we don't start new activities next week. So um, some of the things that we've been doing, uh, I think I can cluster them in, in three areas. One of those areas is to look at the role and nature of the state as an actor within this environment, either challenging or, or working within the... Uh, uh, set of assumptions that comes with this sense of what the market is and what the state's role is in that. So I draw particularly on, on the work of people like Leon, looking at the state's role in negotiating climate change and a response, and, and a response to mitigation. Um, I look at also my own work in the Somali Horn of Africa on state formation and the connections with post-conflict and peace studies, which tries to position that debate outside of narratives which emphasise collapse, failure, and fragility, but instead draws on something which is a bit more about social cohesion and the ways that humans and human societies are adaptable um, and able to build on strengths rather than weakness. And I also want to draw attention to something which is very recent and definitely looking at the future, which is that we are, we've just agreed to put, I think, unless anyone has any objections now, um, to put money into, into developing some of Michael Safia's work, and it's wonderful to see him sitting here, with the diversity cluster to try to present something which I think is a very important part of DPU's legacy. And I'm sorry um, if, if you were going to talk about this from your cluster, but that's the advantage of coming first, isn't it? Um, but this, this is something which is very important, talking about cosmopolitan planning and the role of different actors in trying to foresee some different way of thinking about divided cities, divided societies, and the way different groups work together across divisions or to solve divisions. So that was one, that was, a, that was a, a sort of broad area of understanding the role and nature of the state, looking at legitimacy and uh, political development and so on. Another area that I think we've been, we've been very interested in, um, although I think it isn't reflected so much in, in funded research projects, is reinterpreting and understanding the idea of development, the nature of development. Um, one of the things that there have been a lot of discussions about within cluster meetings has been about the, the change that's being wrought, for example, in Africa by the presence of China as another actor in that, in that arena. Um, I think, again, I'm sorry to talk about myself, but once again, very much about the work that I'm doing in DA6 in teaching, and this connects to another one of the, the um, things that we were asked to reflect on, about, state, about market-led approaches to development and the way that they rely on a particular set of definitions. Now, in fact, within the cluster but, um, and across DPU, there are a great many modules that are dealing with many of those issues in different ways. Um, it's also important to talk about the work that's being done with it by cluster members looking at livelihoods and local level engagement. So essentially working from the top down, but also from the bottom up in analytical terms. Um, thinking again to the future, but only tomorrow, we have a cluster presentation from Nicholas Senior about looking at his research on transactions between landlords and tenants and implicit or explicit comparative frameworks that can be used for understanding those relationships. So that's very much working at the local level um, and trying to understand the processes that govern the interactions between people in either market or state-led environments. Um, I'm also minded of Zero Mariam Frey's work, where one of the things that we've been working on in a project that I've been involved in is looking at rural urban mobility of goods, finance, and labor in northern Ethiopia, and understanding the influence of institutional arrangements, and therefore state policy, as well as informal institutions, on livelihoods and the way that that mobility um, takes place and takes, uh, becomes a part of livelihood strategies. Those things connect to teaching, they connect to research because a lot of those areas are research-based. It's also worth talking, mentioning the, the field trips um, as 
away, and the UED and DAC field trips combined have been a way of exploring some of those issues over the past years. Um, each of those things is a boundary. There are boundaries between teaching and research, which we need to cross. There are disciplinary boundaries, which we need to cross, which I mentioned before. Um, the privilege and responsibility of working with an institution like the DPU is that we are in a unique position where we, we are able to cross boundaries in a way that, that um, reflects the interdisciplinarity of development, but also the, the, the freedom that exists within an institute, within a unit that is postgraduate and research oriented and allows some freedom, some flexibility in the way we use different concepts and different ideas. The cluster in particular gives space to explore some of those, those uh, realities. In terms of research questions, that's where I'm going to finish. Um, I, it's very hard to frame that range of different activities as research questions because those questions will relate to very different levels. But some of those research questions might deal with the issue of how space, how is the space for states to intervene changing as conceptions and practices of development shift. And if the state is a necessary actor in addressing many of the biggest challenges of today, I'm thinking of climate change, sustainability, human welfare, and things like that, then what models and policy approaches are most likely to be effective in, that, in those pursuits? Um, similarly, from whence do states derive the legitimacy to carry out such actions? And how do social or ethnic divisions affect that legitimacy? Um, and the final research question I'm going to posit, and we can, we'll probably discuss these in the cluster as well, um, what can the tools of markets and business tell us about the processes, of inter processes and interventions of development, and what are the limitations of those tools and approaches? I'll leave it there. And uh, I think Cassidy's next. So I'm going to talk about the uh, environmental justice, urbanization, and resilience uh, cluster. Um, <clears throat> I think we are providing value for money in terms of <laughs> reducing um, the heating bills of UCL. <laughs> so we've been advising on that over the past um, few years. Um, <clears throat> To think about, first of all, what, what the cluster has been about to date. I mean, I think when we set out a few years ago, we thought about what were the blind spots in understanding how urbanization operates in metabolizing nature and in the creation and distribution of risks, vulnerabilities, and the opportunities for urban dwellers. So we set out for looking at those distinct ideas and based on three questions that we had defined. The first one is, why and how does the urban produce and reproduce environmental injustices? The second was, under what conditions can resilience shift from coping to a transformation of society and cities? And thirdly, how can planning support synergistic relationships between <coughs> resilience and environmental justice? And we had a meeting last week of the cluster and tried to um, think about where we've come from those questions towards what we want to look in, into the future. And we had quite interesting discussions actually around what people saw as, as future areas for research. Of course, drawing on the year of the DPU 60 um, <clears throat> and, and various experiences from various projects. Um, in terms of what the clusters achieved to date, I don't think I can exactly summarize that, but I think there have been a lot of initiatives in the cluster over the last few years. And I think some of this is culminating in a book that will be published at the end of 2015, which really brings together a lot of the research from the cluster, both from staff and PhD students, um, questioning this relationship between environmental justice and resilience. So that's one of the major things that the cluster has been doing. Um, and, but what I'd like to focus on now is really I have eight points um, upon which what we see as the future research areas and future agendas of the, question, of the cluster. Um, the first one is on translating the research of the cluster into international frameworks. How does the research of the environmental justice, urbanization, and resilience cluster, and in the broader area of environment, ecology, and environmental justice, and socio-environmental trajectories become translated into the SDGs, the new iteration of the Hyogo Framework for Action, the HFA2, 
uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation frameworks and actions, and universal rights to water and sanitation. So really working on what have been the main uh, learnings from this cluster and how do we integrate those into the fra international frameworks going forward. Um, and I think there's many different initiatives within, act within the cluster, um, uh, people who are active in the cluster doing things like that. The second area we see going forward is around operationalizing key concepts in the urban level and in local contexts. And the discussion around this is really, you know, we talk a lot about resilience, we talk a lot about environmental justice, we talk about um, uh, risk, we talk about vulnerability, um, and, and various terms like this. But I think what we see is that really when you get down to working with um, people who work in local governments or other local stakeholders, they really have very little understanding of how to, they may know what it means, but not how to operationalize these into the work that they're doing. Um, and so what we see is really sort of this uh, unawareness of critical environmental health and ecological issues, uh, what the terminologies are, and how to interface with these ideas to pursue environmental agendas. And we think that this is really important, this translation of what is this research we're doing into things that can be you know, operationalized by people uh, locally. Um, and we have uh, certain things that we've been working on for this, for example, working with communities on uh, adaptation and showing how this overlaps with development. Um, we, uh, Vanessa had a project in Maputo. Um, there's a Learning Lima project, uh, the Future Proofing Indian Cities. Um, so there's a number of projects that are sort of starting to do this kind of translation into locally level operations. Um, another thing we talked about is having a common framing of concepts. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of different um, concepts that, that cross these, the different boundaries of the, of the areas of this cluster. And what we felt is that we need to work on developing a common ground on what we're talking about across urban and regional planning, development, and environmental disciplines. So across these disciplines, what are, what are the key terminologies? We need to revisit the key concepts that have been in the major ideas of the cluster, I think, you know, looking at resilience and environmental justice, and have more precision about these. Uh, and so, as I said, the book is one of the examples of the, that kind of work, of clarifying these terminologies. And in that, we really felt that build, bridging old, old ideas and old theories and new theories is something that, that is really important, is, is, is really this sense of, of come from where we've come from and thinking about those theories and those ideas. The fourth is on co-production and co-design in research. And I think this is something that's core to... Uh, everything that the DPU does and something that's probably quite well articulated in the latest uh, DPU news um, is how do we engage with a wider audience of the research users in the actual research? And this is something I think that we're always striving to do in DPU uh, and something we see as central to the cluster going forward. Interested in co-production and co-design and co-framing of the research questions, really. Um, are we asking the research questions that are relevant to research users, especially I was talking about those who are operational, you know, who are working in, in, at the, in cities or with communities. Are we asking the right questions? Do, can we establish a dialogue from the onset to inform the questions we ask? So I think that's sort of something that we seek to do um, all the time and certainly going forward in this cluster. The fifth point is about structural theories. Why are structural cycles of risk accumulation and environmental injustices continuing to grow exponentially? This is, a, this is something that we, I think, is a central research question going forward of the cluster. We want to tackle the understanding of both structural drivers instead of simply producing a thick description of practices. Um, both matters need to be examined in a dialectical way, both practices and um, these understanding of structural drivers. And so we have several projects, I think, for example, uh, Urban Arc, which will be looking at urbanization and uh, risk in African cities, uh, Learning Lima, et cetera, uh, what, the Water Justice Project, I think, that are looking at those issues. The sixth point that we had was on language. And I mean, two. there's sort of two parts to this point. Um, one is that the debates 
that we discuss are often confined to the English language. Most of us are speaking English. Um, some of us have, but luckily, I think in the DPU, we have access to a lot of different languages. And I think what we, what we talked about is that one thing going forward is that we can look at these key arguments and notions in French and Spanish and Portuguese um, or in other languages that we, that we have access to and examine what the key research questions are and how they're being used across different languages. And I think this is something that's, that's quite unique that we would be able to do. So thinking across these boundaries of languages and of the, the different types of, like for example, resilience means something in English but, but doesn't necessarily translate into other languages. The other aspect of that is finding the language that users use and not the way we speak to each other. So a concept such as resilience uh, doesn't necessarily work in certain ways. You have to translate that into other things. Um, and environmental justice also it doesn't somehow we have, you know, it doesn't fit into policy circles. So translating what we mean by the way that users use. So I think that's something that we also need to work on. Um, and I think also on language, bridging, you know, we have to bridge a lot of, um, a lot of disciplinary boundaries across natural, natural sciences, health, epidemiology, you know, we have a lot of different languages to bridge in this cluster. Um, I think there's a, a new MSc in urban health that's, uh, you know, interested in being developed, so this kind of the language in that is very, very important. So the seventh point is on a requirement for quantification on data and city level, including a spatial understanding. I think one of the things that the cluster really wants to do is to get, you know, I think we really have this drive for needing more data, more understanding um, based on having data, having quantification, uh, and also a spatial understanding. So we all work in cities where the most basic data, such as vital registration, including causes of death, disease surveillance systems, et cetera, et cetera, are not functioning, and also where definitions and measurements of poverty are crude and usually do not understand the scale and depth of deprivation. So we need inf more information, a stronger database, stronger understanding of poverty and risk that serves to advise policy and local action and accountability. So really this drive on information and data, I think, was, was very prevalent across the cluster and also, I think the spatial analysis of place is something that we, we really want to work towards, and there's quite a few initiatives within the cluster. For example, the Urban Zoonosis Project that's, that's using mapping of livestock and food practices in communities of Nairobi, um, the mapping ur urban energy landscapes, uh, learning Lima. These are all sort of ways of, of trying to map space. And so I think we really want to use this, establish both the data and the spatial understanding. Um, and that this kind of thing can be used by different actors, and especially if you look at the Zoonosis Project, like that it's being done by uh, communities uh, for their own information in order to interact. I think that's the kind of thing that we want pushing forward. And the last point I'd like to make is particularly around the issue, around the topic of environmental justice. And, and just to raise the point that I think, we think that environmental justice is really not uptaken in many, in many uh, areas. And there are very different trajectories. Certainly environmental justice is something that is seen to um, belong to social movements. And I, think, and I think we were saying that, you know, there's a lot to learn from those who are the producers of so social mobilization on, on how environmental justice is operationalized. And I think there is also an issue around environmental justice is, tends towards the ideological but doesn't translate into policy circles. And I think what we want to do is, you know, through the use of different terminologies and, and different, different actions around um, around framing research questions is how to make that translation between this ideas of environmental justice that are used more in social mobilization and how it can work into policy circles. Those are my points. Thank you. I don't have research questions. <laughs> so I think I'm going to be talking here from the urban transformation clusters perspective. And the urban transformation clusters, for, um, for those who don't know it, is a, is a very big cluster. 
uh, in that it reflects, in a sense, the, the very long legacy of the, of the DPU working around issues of urban development and thinking about urban change and how to intervene in, um, in the city and, and sort of variously defined urban environments. And so most of us in the DPU are in one way or another, in fact, involved in thinking about urban transformations. So it makes for a relatively slow moving and very interesting machine, the cluster. <laughs> so, I think it's been for many of us a very intense year. Um, for many of the members, we've been all of us in different ways um, involved in thinking about urban transformations <coughs> and about um, crossing boundaries in the process of thinking about urban transformations. We, most of us have been involved in shaping the DPU conference on that very theme. We've been developing a, sh a series of short films looking at the notion of the urban global south, um, what it means as a notion, what it means for theory, and what it means for planning practice. Um, and also I think what's important to, to note is that our reflections about urban transformations have been also quite a lot um, impacted by the various um, international processes of, of rethinking urban transformation that are going on at the moment. I'm thinking in particular at the Habitat 3 uh, upcoming agenda, the, the revision of the Hugo Framework for Action, uh, climate change conference uh, coming up in Paris next year, and of course, more tangentially, we hope more urban, but it's still a bit tangential, uh, with the SDG negotiations. So there's all these international process about rethinking uh, urban transformation and ways to engage with that. And I think because many of us have been involved in these, in these process and continue to be involved, this has obviously um, uh, influenced our thinking. So a lot of, of, uh, of work on looking back and looking forward in the cluster, which has asked us to, to look across boundaries of theory, of practice, of advocacy, uh, talking different languages with communities, with multinational organizations, and continuing to have an ongoing conversations with our colleagues in the academia. Um, so what we are trying to do at the moment in the cluster, we are, so, so this, is a, you know, this is a moment for you to, to, to have a look and continue what's going to be, what's going to happen within the cluster, is we're trying to sort of refine and re-clarify a little bit the way, the DNA of the clusters, or maybe it's fair to say the way in which we map out the activities that we are, that we are doing. Um, this is very much a work in progress, so watch, watch this space and hopefully you will be seeing it more concretely um, on the website, the way in which the website is reconfigured. I think obviously the, the primary question which exercises us in the cluster and has been and continues to be and will continue to be is how do or how can urban development planning and design practices bring about transformative change in cities of the global south? So this is really our overarching question. And that, ine that inevitably is underpinned uh, by a number of boundary crossing issues such as the, the boundaries between theory and practice, uh, between academia and the world of practice. But here we mean the world of not just practice, but the world of hopeful, of, of real change, as, uh, as was coined in a, in a very recent conference, uh, the Nairus conference. Um, the boundaries between disciplines when we're thinking about urban transformations, because inevitably cities are inherently complex, multidimensional systems and transformations depends on multiple entry points or points of engagement. Um, the boundaries between actors in the state, market and civil society uh, involved in the process of transformation and change and of course the boundaries between urban global north and urban global south. So all of this are sort of boundaries we're constantly engaging in our work. The, the first one, if you want, the one around theory and action, um, it's quite clear that at the DPU, um, action research has always been key to the way in which we're thinking research. Uh, the DPU was set up to think through new modes of planning and designing, new ways of intervening in fast-growing and changing cities of the then third world. Uh, it was calling for action which was imbued with a recognition of the particularities of these fast-growing cities, particular knowledge about these places, um, the perseverance of informality, demographic dislocations, reconfigurations of state, private, and collective actors. So this was very much uh, research and action interlinked. 
And this very much remains at the core of the, what the DPU does. We're involved in research whose ultimate objective is to map out trajectories towards socio-environmental and spatial justice. And at the same time, the way in which we think about the urban processes are very much imbued by what we observe and the sort of processes that we support uh, in practice. What we are trying to do, though, in, as we reconfigure a little bit the way in which we present the work of the cluster, is to build on this action research uh, legacy and possibly a little bit more. So it's really, I'm going to say something which sounds very categorically different, but actually it's not. It's much more, it's a nuance about, about forwarding, if you want, our analytical knowledge and understanding about urban processes. What we want to do, in a sense, is to forefront and regroup some of our analytic work, analytical work about how we understand the co-production of the built environment and social life in the current era. How do we understand urbanization processes and different kinds of urbanism? Because it's quite clear that we're dealing with huge, hugely different processes, whether it's slum urbanism, whether it's peripheral urbanism, where it's in the urbanism in the peri-urban interface, the urbanism of these mega cities, or actually the urbanization of these secondary cities, which are growing quite fast. So we want to sort of forefront this analysis that we are, that we are, that we are doing um, in the cluster and, in fact, very often in conjunction with other, other clusters. Um, the kinds of questions that we are seeking to address are how do the multiple temporal and scalar processes of urbanization transform social life? How do women and men, girls and boys, move in and out of poverty in cities? You recognize a lot of the language that we have that is very familiar to, to the DPU. How are the increasing demands for connectivity and mobility shaping the urban? How is the increasing marketization of the production of public and private space impacting on the city? How is informality shaped, reproduced, and exploited in the city? So these are a whole series of questions which we are already involved in looking at and, and within the cluster, and we are trying to, to um, look at in a maybe slightly more, or, or put forward in a slightly more categorical way. Um, I think the, the place-making activities of local government and communities in this process of urban transformation has always been core at the DPU and certainly continues to be. Here I just want to um, emphasize two elements that we're maybe wanting to push a little bit more in the years to come. One of them is to uh, refocus on the on the, the the role of the or the sorry the changing role of them of the private sector. We are not as, uh, I mean, we are set maybe in a point where the, the role of the private sector is changing, but we're not, neither are we in a post-neoliberal world as was hoped or thought about at the time of the 2008 crisis. So we have to engage with these processes of regulatory capitalism, um, understanding the long-term constraints of um, the ways in which, sorry, private financing of key transport and energy infrastructures are shaping future city trajectories and indeed planning processes. So we really need to maybe forefront a little bit the ways in which various private sectors, various capitals, if you want, are shaping our cities. And to think about what cases of social innovation practices um, are to be found, what kinds of boundaries can be crossed with the private sector, with the market, with community groups. Uh, can we think about private-public community partnerships that are actually bringing about what we would aspire to be a progressive urban, transva urban transformation, urban transformations for socio-economic and environmental justice. Um, so we're working, we've started a number of seminar, uh, a series of seminars on these issues. Another point which we have been doing traditionally in the DPU but has we, we need to continually re-emphasize because it is hard to do um, is this, this notion of, of integrating uh, these, the cross-cutting issues of diversity and the environment in every thinking that we do about uh, urban transformations. I mean, we're, we're in an incredibly privileged position at the DPU to do that because we are a relatively small unit which has uh, a, a good, where there's a lot of flow of conversation amongst us, where a lot of the of the of our colleagues straddle different interests, and yet we sometimes still represent some of the work that we do slightly through silos. 
it's, it, it, it's difficult to overcome that. Uh, we all know that we mustn't. Most of the time we manage not to, but it's something that we constantly need to remind ourselves about doing. Um, so these are the two points I really wanted to make about the theory, uh, about our, our forefronting of theory. Now what seems to be obvious also is that when we are talking about recalibrating our research on urban transformation purposes, that this is a, at heart an inherently political process. We're talking here mainly about looking at the multiple process of injustices in the city and we want to try and, and address these. And so the question that we want to continue pushing forward, and again, it's a legacy, but we want to bring that, uh, we want to continue that kind of reflection, is what kind of urban, uh, urban politics constrain or create opportunities for the production of just cities? If you want, we want to think about how do urban politics shape processes of urban transformations? And some of the sub-questions that we are working on at the moment is what is the transformative potential of social mobilization and contentious politics about and in the city? We are, again, very lucky in the DPU to be working in a lot of different geographical settings where the tradition, the political cultures, the ways of mobilizing are very different. And there is something to be learned about them and to, 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 very, to, to develop the kinds of conversations that we can have across these geographies for understanding the politics of urban transformation. How do different forms of political organization in the city produce injustice or reproduce injustice? What are the key arenas of governance in the production of the just city? How can urban governance, when, how is, is it at times co-opted? Um, how can local governments frame the action of urban actors in the pursuit of just urban transformations? These are the kinds of questions that we're, we're asking. And of course, finally, at the DPU, as our work is fundamentally located in, in the realm of action. Planning and design is central to the way in which we think and operate in the field. And so, um, in the cluster, we, our last overarching or sort of our last question is how can planning and design advance progressive practices in the city? This is the kind of work that we've been working a lot within the DPU in the past. So, in a sense, we are building there on the research, sorry, the research that we've been uh, doing that we continue to do also through the field trips. Um, and I will only give you some of the the, the current areas of focus that we have, upgrading at a city-wide scale, um, how do we think about land value capture, uh, uh, how do we become smarter about thinking about smarter cities, the smarter city debate. So I'll, I'll conclude very quickly about the methodologies that we are thinking that underpin all these reflections within the cluster. Uh, the one is this notion of transdis uh, the, the transdisciplinary methodology and the notion of co-production. I won't talk much about it because actually Cassidy has raised a lot of the issues that are very pertinent to the urban transformation cluster. We work in the cluster with community groups, with local government, with international um, organization, and there is a big question as to how do we ensure, how do we ask questions with these various groups? How do we ensure that the language in, that we developed in thinking about this relates to these various groups? And how do we ensure that there is an ethics when we engage with various different partners? These are fundamental questions um, uh, when we, in our methodology. And I think I just want to close uh, very briefly, if I may, Julio, with his hat on, <laughs> just to say that uh, in, th that also we, we, th there's an interesting boundary that we are thinking that we are crossing and not crossing and thinking about, which is this urban global north and urban global south boundary. Uh, we, we, we produced a, a really interesting series of short films where we interviewed a lot of people within the DPU, within UCL and some of our colleagues to think about this notion and how it... Uh, can, how, whether it's still an appropriate notion to have, whether it challenges the way in which we, we think about cities and the way in which we act in cities. Um, and it's obviously a very contested and, and, and sometimes slippery concept, um, and it's a political one. What's very interesting and what's very apparent is that increasingly in, in, uh, in uh, conferences and in conversation that invoke 
global urbanism or global processes, there's a, it's often done from the, on the part actually talking from the north, uh, and there's a sort of calling upon the experiences of the south in terms of mobilization and in terms of alternative and social innovation and in terms of alternative practices in the city. So while it's very nice that this recognition is finally taking place in the north, what is a bit problematic is the way in which it's done often in a way that is quite naive, that sort of uh, seems to imply that this kind of mobilization and these practices, uh, often community practices, are done because just these communities are so mobilized in the south and we've lost all of that in the north. So we really need to, uh, to, to think about being much more uh, critical uh, in the way in which we think about this north and south boundary crossing. Thank you. I made a little presentation as well, so let's see if that's, that's going to work. I'm going to talk about some of the reflections around the diversity, social complexity, plan intervention in clusters. Um, it's a very difficult act to follow those, uh, you know, the, the previous interventions, but I will do my best. I'd like to talk about some of the themes to, of the cluster uh, that emerged uh, through this one year and one year plus of discussions that we have been having at the DPU and with our friends, colleagues, uh, not only through the events, but also through our publications, through our conversations and dialogues. So I'm going to be making some references to some of this work and some of those reflections. Well, a good place to start, I think, is... Uh, uh, a paper that was published uh, at uh, a great journal called Environmental Urbanization, uh, uh, which we all uh, please read, uh, you know, it's a great, but I do think it's, uh, um, apart from being a great journal, I think Karen's uh, publication that came up in 2013, uh, it's actually quite interesting and I think uh, it's, it's helping a lot to think about some of the key discussions that we've been having in relation to the class. The, the paper is entitled Travel Choice Reframe Deep Distribution and Gender in Urban Transport. Um, in this publication, Karen articulates the concept of deep distribution, referring to debates around urban transport, but actually articulating a really useful concept to think about urban inequalities more generally. Karen recognized in that paper that development planning has not been able to address the growing urban social inequalities affecting our cities and that there is an urgent need to interrogate the structural conditions that enable or disable distribution in cities. In the following quote, uh, Karen explains the concept of this deep distribution in relation to urban transport. I hope she doesn't mind. I changed a few words just to open up uh, the debate from transport uh, to a little bit larger in terms of the debate here. But it goes, an approach that recognizes deep distribution builds the foundations for an understanding of the urban based on the articulation of power relations in public and private space at the level of the household, the community, and society that generate the structural inequality and dominant relations under which decisions about everyday lives of women and men, girls and boys in urban areas are negotiated and made. Um, I think it's, it's, it's quite a, of, a, of a strong quote and one that tells us a lot about a good starting point to think about some of the issues related to the class system. To some extent, everyday lives are proposed here as a device to examine not only localized practices, but wider societal norms and structural inequalities in cities. And actually, the work that many of us in the DPU has been precisely working within this direction, interrogating the micro-realities as a means to explore wider relations of power, conditioning the negotiation of multiple social identities produced through acts of conflict and cooperation. I think a good example of that is, uh, is the work of uh, a new colleague of ours, Andrea Rigon. And I think this paper is, is, is a very interesting um, illustration of the type of work that emerges through the uh, examination of these micro-realities. This paper is entitled Building Local Governance, Participation, and Elite Capture in Islamic Upgrade in Kenya. And it's published in Development and Change in January 2014. And it engages in a micro-level analysis of the soci social relations produced in a particular informal settlement in Nairobi to indicate their implications to Islam upgrading program. Andrea makes an insightful ethnographic account exploring how a so-called participatory process has led to the institutionalization of existing inequalities. 
In similar lines, uh, Kamna Patel's forthcoming chapter on reciprocity in informal settlements in Durban, South Africa, I don't have a picture because it hasn't come out yet, but it's in the <laughs> making, um, interrogate acts of uh, reciprocity in his study sites as symbols of social relationships and interpersonal power relations. The micro realities I studied through the narratives of 24 respondents recorded in personal diaries every time a gift was exchanged. It's quite interesting as a methodology here in engaging with these kind of ethnographic studies and narratives uh, through diaries. And I think uh, we are all looking forward to, to, that, to, to, to the outcome of that research. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a bit of myself as well, as Michael, the, the president, was talking about himself. Uh, in my own work uh, in July, I engaged in a research about the practice of occupations in vacant buildings in inner city Sao Paulo. In this research, I have been documenting personal life uh, tra trajectories of re residents of buildings occupied by social movements as a means to understand the role these occupations play in their struggles over substantive citizenship in Sao Paulo. So again, really engaging to these micro realities, the life stories, and this is, was one of the exercises that we did in, in, in that field, field work. Cross-cutting these three research activities is the understanding of experiences in localities in all of their diversity, avoiding the romanticization of the concept of community, revealing contradictions and complexities, while at the same time concerned with means through which social diversity can be recognized more productively in policy and planning initiatives. Well, this interest uh, of the cluster in, in the institutionalization of social diversity in policy and planning was discussed in quite detail in the event in March, organized by Karen Levy, entitled Gender in Policy and Planning Mainstreamed, Manipulated or Sidelined. What a great title, by the way, uh, for, for opening the debate. This event involved a series of speakers and guests that have been involved with the DPU Gender Policy and Planning uh, Program, which is a program led by Karen Levy and Julian Walker, and has been advancing on knowledge and expertise for a critical approach to mainstreaming a gender perspective in development policy, planning, and research, as well as exploring gender relations in democratic governance. Um, this event was actually a celebration of uh, 30 years of, of the Gender Policy and Planning Program. Drawing on discussions between Caroline Moser, Rosalind Aben, Elaine Ulten Halker, and, and, and you know, there was many great names in the room, uh, there was a general concern that since the 1990s, there has been an increase in deterioration of the conditions to bring about gender empowerment. As Elaine argued, the massive emergence of the private sector since then transformed feminism into a tune that the market plays, without the empowerment content present in early initiatives of gender planning. Nevertheless, Rosalind Aben emphasized the role of the margins as a site to bring about the institutionalization of transformative change. Rosalind talks about the space between being inside as well as outside, linking activism with the production of new norms of procedures inside institutions. Similarly, in her roundup comments, Karen articulated the need to continue talking, producing, and mainstreaming methodologies. And she says, I could spend the whole day talking about methodologies, and I think we all believe that's true, as methodologies have been central to what we have done. And it is not an accident, because when you introduce a new way of looking at something, and you are committed to wanting to change practices around that, you have to talk about methodologies. You have to show people, at least present to them an option. It is, a, it is about moving from the why to the what and how. To be able to do that, you have to talk methodologies. I cannot make as, you know, as enthused as, as, as a presentation, but I guess you get the, the idea behind it. From a DPU perspective, in, in line with uh, action feminism research traditions, such methodology means working not about, but with communities. Uh, and I think that's important to stress. Where knowledge production is embedded and situated into local realities and contestations, as well as focusing on reflexivity and action. The session at the DPU conference in July, entitled Gender Intersectionality and Socially Just Futures, Planning in an Area of Social Polarization, again, another great title, um, was particularly addressing this question of what, what type of planning, thinking, and practices are needed to bring about gender empowerment in current times. Julian Walker, drawing on the work we have been doing through our engagement in Kisumu with uh, practical action uh, on the role of neighborhood planning associations and bringing in bringing about substantive citizenship, outlined three key areas for further work in the field of gender planning. 
Firstly, he argued that gender planning, apart from emphasizing the role of agency, it should also recognize the positive contributions of relations of care, and therefore acknowledge that interdependencies does not have to be a problem per se. This opens up a series of debates around reciprocity and solidarities across difference that needs further investigation and analysis in the process of empowerment. Secondly, Julian argued that gender planning has been more productive in dealing with the oppressive social relations that's already recognized, rather than the denial of certain social relations. And thirdly, Julian outlined the, the need to build on the work around gender interests and needs, and we need to start focusing also on the realm of aspirations. Referring to the work of Apadurai on the capacity to aspire, Julian argued it is these wider aspirations that many sub subaltern groups' claims are reduced and narrowed by reinforcing the sort of hegemonic exclusions of these groups. In the same, in the same conference, uh, Galtenbaum from the Indian Institute of, the, of Human Settlement, drawing on his own engagement with queer politics in India, he stressed the importance of further focus from planning on the practice of solidarities and aspirational thinking. Gautam articulated the need for political spaces to enable uneasy, uncertain, and unexpected solidarities. In his own words during the conference, and that's a, it's quite of a big quotation, but I have to do it. It was, a kind of a, <laughs> you know, it was quite an amazing, amazing one. Um, the question that queer politics asks of planning is to see how were the, these uneasy alliances created. And is it, is it possible that the city can be the basis of multiple solidarities that cross identities? The, that belonging to the city, that claim, that act of producing and performing your urban citizenship can be a claim that crosses more traditional political subjectivities as those of a worker or those of a national citizen. This is the promise that the new literature on urban citizenship offered. He continues, what would mean to insert solidarity building into planning? If planning is not just a technical exercise, but a political one, this must be its politics. This must be one of the tasks it tasks itself. The frame of our intervention must be to think about how one creates new spaces where things can become possible. You cannot create solidarities, but you can create foundations that create kinds of solidarities. One part of the theoretical work needed is to be attentive to the fact that the configurations of inequality take particular forms, particular times, and particular spaces, and each of those configurations of inequalities require a new solidarity as effective resistance. The reflections emerging from these, um, from these, uh, 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 from emerging from these discussions and conversations over these DPU anniversary years bring to the forefront the need of our research of the cluster to think and act beyond the following boundaries. Firstly, the work on deep distribution and micro-realities outlines the needs for our work to cross the boundaries of scale, from everyday practices to the production of societal norms. The debates from our seminar on gender mainstreaming calls for the crossing of the boundaries of the inside and outside, where a third space, the marginal, the liminal, emerges as potential locus for the production of alternative and transformative politics. Thirdly, the reflections from the DPU conference identified the need to cross boundaries of identities and subjectivities as means to build deeper bonds of uneasy solidarities. And fourthly, drawing, drawing on the work of bell hooks, our thinking on solidarity need to be crossing the boundaries of time, reflecting not only on the histories of oppressions and resistance, but also on the alliances of what is yet to come, on the articulation of a more just vision of the future. In terms of potential spaces to advance some of these uh, questions, many of our members of the classes are invo involved in two large research projects where we will be, there will be some opportunities to investigate uh, more specific questions in relation to these uh, wider debates. One of them is the five-year ongoing research project on well-being of urban citizens in Nigeria funded by DFIT. And the second one is a three-year engagement to set up a Sierra Leone urban research center focused on building capacities and knowledge for improving the well-being of slum dwellers. This project is funded by Comic Relief and DFIT and is due to start in 2015. Um, the, the issues emerging from the discussions during this year will also be explored, I think, from the initiative that Michael just made a reference to. 
focus at the revisiting Michael Safer's work on the concept of cosmopolitan planning. And I think there's a little picture of him here on the left, looking up and thinking <laughs> aspirational. Uh, and well, and I think I guess this is going to be a very interesting opportunity to to talk about a lot of those issues in the cluster. And uh, I, I guess this has been a very stimulating year, very productive. And I hope you find it was value for money. And, uh, and we, we look forward to share with you and think of you in terms of the years ahead, in terms of issues of social diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. You will rekindle us. And <laughs> throw a bit of We're going to do some exercise to warm up, right? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, before I forget, there, for those of you who didn't get copies of the latest DPU News, which has a fantastic article, uh, which sort of brings all this together, um, really coordinated and, you know, the first draft was written by Vanessa, but, you know, you are the great author of this. Um, there are copies here, so please help yourselves. I'd rather not take them back uh, to DPU. So, David. Wow. Um, where do we go from here into the future? Um, I started making detailed notes, and then at some point I thought, well, there's going to be far too much to try to summarize there, so why don't I start in parallel writing down things that I haven't heard mentioned? And then I found myself almost one by one crossing those off. <laughs> so there's not a lot really left to say. <laughs> but I have a solution to the problem. Seeing that co-production, which seems to be the latter-day form of participatory methods on which some of us were brought up, it's time for a little bit of participation. <laughs> and seeing that each of the four presentations was almost entirely different in terms of the style of presentation, the content, the degree of audiovisual aids used, and so on, we have a multi-criteria decision-making matrix to hand. So the keypads are going to come in useful. <laughs> but I think that really is the point. Um, I'm not sure I can say a whole lot in terms of commentary on. Um, you've taken very diverse perspectives. Um, you, you, you've tackled the, the challenges in different ways. But I will just pick up a couple of things which perhaps haven't been mentioned, at least explicitly, although I think they're, they're perhaps implicit in, in a number of points. But then also just a, a few things, um, perhaps as provocation to debate, but crucially, um, as we all chase our tails ever faster in circles, um, that there are some other things worth not losing sight of, and crucially, not losing hold of. So what have I not heard mentioned? Well, I thought I was going to get away with saying um, the idea of transcending the sort of ultimate geographical boundary of the global north and south, and then Barbara slips in just towards the end of, of her presentation, but only partially. Um, and this, I suppose, comes back to... <laughs> you misread it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you thought it was one. Um, <laughs> but it, it does come back, in a sense, to, to the origins, the traditions of, of the DPU, which we, we've heard about. So it's not a criticism, it's, it's just an observation, that whereas many institutions, many curricula, uh, many research agendas have sought, in a sense, specifically to, for want of a better term, go global, um, I mean, you, you alluded to the idea of, of, of global or, or planetary urbanism, which is a debate in which some people at UCL are, are very actively involved beyond the DPU. Um, it's interesting that the core activity here still remains focused on, for what a better term, the global sun. Um, what one does with the labels, how one, one reframes it, um, again, different people have, have tackled in different ways, and I'm not even sure that necessarily you should do so, except, though, if one does push those particular boundaries, how does DPU, how do research agendas of the four clusters engage with the kinds of places, the kinds of regions, indeed the kinds of processes, which make that kind of dichotomized container uh, problematic? 
so to what extent do we engage with Eastern and Central Europe? Uh, do we engage with parts of the Southern European fringe, which again or still perhaps have more in common with certain areas in the Global South than they do with parts of Northern Europe and, and other OECD regions? Just the same as uh, if you really want to get into trouble quickly, go to Singapore and start talking to people about you know, being in the third world. They go absolutely mad and start citing stats which prove, in fact, that they're not. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, we heard in, in several contexts about rethinking development and the challenges of what that means in a global context where the whole notion of development to many people um, academic practitioners and others is discredited and yet many of us continue to to work in those sorts of agendas and of course the problems <coughs> and challenges which indeed the DPU and many others were set up to, to address remain as pervasive um, as before albeit in perhaps slightly different forms um, approaches understandings become perhaps more refined get delineated and so on but I didn't hear very much, or a couple of hints, I didn't hear very much about rethinking planning, the other word in the institution's title. I said it was implicit, and there were passing references in terms of methodology, in terms of the relationship between theory and, and practice, or praxis, um, perhaps the methodologies of co-creation, co-production, co-definition, take us there via different routes. Um, and it's interesting that many places which have thought of co-production as theirs, including the uh, research entity that I now head, um, has become increasingly widespread. And so there are numerous institutions. This is one, Mr. Urban Future is another. Uh, the Urban Cluster at IDS, uh, which is fairly new, is another, and I could go on. So in a sense, one of the interesting things becomes almost to do a kind of meta uh, study, which part of the work we're doing is, is, is starting to do that, of, of the different forms of co-production and the meanings, and crucially, what are the challenges and what are the limitations? Because like so many of these methodologies, in certain quarters, they get taken up as the panacea, as the magic bullet that's going to solve all the problems, and yet, as we know from decades of work in participatory methods, which as I said jokingly a moment ago, but actually it's a serious point, um, is in a sense a forerunner of what we now talk about as co-production creation. Many of the same limitations and problems apply. Uh, and perhaps you could pick that up in, in some of the ideas about rethinking the vocabularies, uh, the meanings, the, the articulations between the sort of theory, policy and practice, which several of you alluded to in, in, in different ways. Um, again, I suppose it was implicit, but I wondered to what extent the increasing sort of speed and, and changing nature of the way in which our spatial order, as a function of the wider sort of geopolitical and geoeconomic orders, um, are changing the places and the processes we're concerned about, are actually being taken up. In, in the work that you do and, and the thinking about it and the, the policy nature. So the sort of de- and re-territorializations that occur constantly, the mention of, of, of cities and changing urban, the one or two mentioned peri-urbanization and all the rest of it. But you know, in some contexts, city regions are becoming much more of a useful um, planning entity or, or, or a frame, a container to think about things. I heard almost nothing about intermediate and smaller urban centres. The focus, again, both explicitly and I guess implicitly, was still very much on capital cities, metropolitan areas, mega cities of one sort or another. Um, and I look smiling at Dave Satterthwaite right there, who has again articulated these things over a long period of time, both from IAD and, of course, in, in teaching and work done here within in DPU. But that lacuna remains as severe as ever. Um, and, and as the processes of urbanization get, get kind of redefined through all these changing divisions of space, labor, uh, politics, and economics, 
um, the meanings even of in environmental and urban justice um, take on sometimes quite different forms in, in different types of cities as well as similar types of places in different uh, contexts. Um, equally, in the context of a planning unit thinking forward, uh, the sort of cities yet to come, uh, the idea that you know, almost as many new cities and, and places for people in those cities are going to be built over the next couple of decades as have been built in the past, is a huge challenge in terms of broader issues of resilience, vulnerability, adapting to the realities of climate change and all the kinds of transformations that we're increasingly concerned about in that context. And yet, funnily enough, I did not hear the word sustainability mentioned once tonight. Um, and though sustainability is discredited in different circles as well, it's become a, an empty, hollow shell for others, um, but it is still, a, at the very least, a, a, a rhetorical device, a, a normative concept under which many of these other labels of vulnerability, resilience, um, justice, and so on, uh, could be subsumed. And I was just struck by the fact that nobody, uh, at least that I heard, mentioned that. Um, and then, I suppose, finally, as a way back to the start of the session and thinking about the history of the institution, and I was thinking back as, as you were all talking about how long I've known the DPU, and the answer is frighteningly long. <laughs> My very first time through the doors in the former premises around the corner in Ensley Street were a conference on urban planning organised, I think, in 1988. It was just after I'd finished my own PhD. And Mike Safer was actually organised, I think, by the two Michaels um, and, and Pat Wakeley. And if I think about what the concerns were at the time and how they've morphed in some respects, and yet the underlying concerns, problems, and challenges remain very much intact, um, in a sense, that, that's a metaphor for how the world has changed and how um, you know, our concerns, the theoretical um, paradigms, um, the, the, the practices, the methodological approaches have changed and yet the concerns remain remarkably enduring. And of course, during that process, the DPU perhaps has been subject to changing pressures and had to adapt um, even more profoundly than uh, a conventional academic department. Because until remarkably recently, um, the, the sort of treadmill uh, that staff here, in common with IDS and Sussex and almost nowhere else I can immediately think of, had to um, cope with was being sort of academics, being super consultants, um, being advisors to various international agencies and governments and constantly on the move. And one of the major frustrations was the inability to find sufficient time to publish in academic circles. And then as the RAE culture became more deeply embedded, as the DPU found itself incorporated within the Bartlett School, and I remember being involved in some of the challenges and debates at, at that time, um, trying to facilitate certain things, um, part of that reality has changed, and in many ways, um, DPU staff are today much more like conventional academics, but also super academics, because that consultancy, that advisory work still continues. But the adaptation that's been made in terms of publishing um, much more in, in academic journals and in books than was the case until, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, um, undoubtedly has changed the nature of the pressures and, and interesting to think about how those have been coped with, new generations coming in, changing work-life balance considerations, um, employment regulations and legislations. The balance between, therefore, the teaching, the research, the advisory and the consultancy role. The, the reconfiguring of courses to, again, reflect changing concerns and adaptations. And in that sense, um, reflecting on the research clusters. Um, I come from a department which was probably the first, or certainly one of the very first in, in sort of UK geography, to create research groups. And I was one of the people who helped set up the very first one. 
And it was quite interesting at the time, the debate that that engendered, and of course then it was immediately copied, and you know, then of course the, the RE culture and so on has meant it's, it's become the norm. But every now and again, we have a sort of exercise of stepping back and thinking, you know, are they still fit for purpose? Do they actually work for us, and if so, how? Um, and one of the real challenges, and again, I'd be fascinated to, to, to sort of hear your reflection on that, is how you avoid becoming too inwardly focused in the sense of competition between the clusters, um, the rivalries the, you know, over access to resources and, and all the other things, and when master's programs become associated with particular clusters, then you know, dot, 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 where do we fit research students in so that they benefit from the opportunities the structure creates rather than constraining opportunities? And um, in a sense, I suppose the importance of ensuring through all this and all these challenges and the day-to-day -day, um, buffeting that, that we get in UK higher education is ensuring that the whole remains fundamentally more than the sum of the parts. Maybe that's a suitable point at which to, to stop and open it up for broader discussion. <coughs> Great, thank you, David. That was that was excellent, and thank you for your generous words as usual. Um, can I open it up to discussion? Um, we don't have a lot of time, partly because we'll turn into little icebergs if we stay here too too long. But uh, but you know, my colleagues uh, and David have opened up very interesting areas. Uh, it's very dense. Uh, it's not only the last year, but it's you know many many years of work and, and fantastic work. I'm, I'm extremely proud of being working with my colleagues um, who are extremely productive. Sometimes I have to tell them to stop a little bit and think <laughs> of work-life balance uh, and reduce the engagement. But um, <coughs> so um, any any urgent points, any questions, queries, comments? Those with the hats, those without the hats. <laughs> Karen. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you to my colleagues who did a really interesting job. Uh, I, I think your comment on the rethinking planning is something that struck me particularly because that happens to be my particular area that I work on a lot. And, and perhaps in some ways, I think that you're right to have picked up this notion of co-production as almost a substitute for the kind of uh, terminology that we might have used some years ago in talking and thinking about planning. Um, but I think that planning is really very central to our preoccupations and, and how it's done. And I think that um, that as particularly Alex illustrated, the question of methodology has been one of the most important elements of this process. And it's not just co-production that's informed that. It's also um, responding to change, to uncertainty, um, to political processes, and thinking through methodologies and what, they, what social change means, actually, mm -hmm. and, and how it becomes institutionalized, um, is, is, I think, has been an underlying preoccupation of, of most of the clusters in, in, in one way or another. But I think it is really, the, the title of our conference was called Reimagining Planning. And, and in a sense, that's still very central to what we do and think. But thank you for picking that up, because in a sense, maybe it had dropped out of sight a little bit with so many other things that we, that we uh, uh, that, you know, that were raised, which are very important and all have implications for planning. But uh, I think it's, a, it's still a very central preoccupation of what we, you know, how we think about those things. And in that process, this distinction between North and South becomes mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. crucial and very critical. Thank you, Karen. Any, anybody else wants to? David. I suppose there were a lot of hints of it, but we've got to achieve in the next 30 to 60 years a decarbonization of the world economy. Otherwise, we're stuffed. And everything else actually pales into insignificance if we look at business as usual for the next 30 to 50 years. Now, a lot of elements were there, but the, 
big push was, you know, um, uh, David Simon says, what, two billion new urbanites. Just the infrastructure to serve those new urbanites um, would push us strongly towards dangerous climate change. So it also means that those of us that have worked on the global south, where we're working in cities which have very low carbon um, outputs per person, we're now challenged to work in the global north as the way of reducing risk for the global south and for the whole planet. And lots of what was said has insights into that. We've just got to remember that one of the big goals for all of us is low carbon. And, um, and in a sense, we have a responsibility to follow that, even if it isn't within our particular disciplinary um, competence. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? <laughs> Vanessa, Vanessa. Karen, did you want to come back on? I want to <coughs> take up David's challenge about the term sustainability and it sort of builds on, on other David's uh, comment. And in a sense, I think that the way in which it's emerged, for example, in the SDGs and its continued link to economic growth, I think people find deeply, deeply frustrating about the way in which the, the word has been appropriated and used. Mm -hmm. and of course, there's huge debate and which we can get into. And the, but I, I think it was interesting that it didn't come tonight. And I think it was a good, that was an interesting comment to make. Because I think we have turned our back on it in a way. Uh, or we redefine what the issues are. And we talk about environmental justice and we talk about mm -hmm. resilience and the intersection between them. Um, almost as an alternative language to the questions of sustainability. And to some extent, perhaps, perhaps sustainability is run its course. I don't know. Mm, do any of you want to pick up any of these points? There have been sort of a couple of challenges and comments. I might pick up on the sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I actually had actually had, if I read the first sentence, which I didn't end up to end up saying, is about the role of cities in sustainable development has been acknowledged. And, uh -huh. and so I think that, that was actually, I think, for the, for the uh, EJER cluster, I think this is really our departing point. And I think that, the, that it's still absolutely valid. And I think that the, the point that I was trying to make about, about um, operationalizing key concepts, and I think this you know, operationalizing the concept of sustainability is still very much valid. And, and that, you know, I don't think that we always need to seek these new terminologies and new ways of reframing things. Okay. And then from my perspective, I think um, in terms of the, present, I mean, the, the issue around the larger changes, the, the, the fundamental changes, and I think that's a, um, I think it's very present to the, I guess the work that we all do in, is in collaboration of many other actors and, and, and structures and platforms. And I think thinking through this as, as collective engagement and action that uh, supporting wide, uh, wider types of alliances and engagement, I think that's the, the way that we've been, I think, engaging often in terms of not thinking centrality, what is that we will as, as, a, as an entity 
bring about the types of change alone, but actually what type of supporting, enabling agents can we play to bring about this type of alliances and, and, and actions and reflections and thinking that would allow thinking through the challenges, what are the real challenges that we're facing, how it's been addressed and how can we address them in the future. So I think this, this role of, of acting with others, I think it's an important aspect of the work that we've been doing and I think it's an interesting thing to think through, not only in terms of the challenges, what can we as a unit deal with these challenges, but what can we with others and in terms of embedding the wider struggles can contribute to this, to this challenge. Okay. You don't need to say. No, no, I, I think the, the planning, uh, rethinking planning here has been essential, and if it doesn't come out, it's because it was the last part of the three elements that we that we have in the cluster, and we're and in a sense, it's building on a very long history of perpetually rethinking planning, and so I brushed through it because it was the end, and because it's so central to what we do. So I realize, obviously, a, a big fault in the way it's presented because it remains completely central. Um, I think what's it, the, the interesting element about that, as you mentioned the other day, that is this, this notion of decarbonization in, in the city. And I think that is a challenge for us. I mean, how do we bring these cross-cutting issues and these ultimately fundamental issues of change within our everyday processes of thinking about planning and doing planning with active... It's, it's, it is probably our most fundamental challenge. Um, and, and clusters sometimes help and sometimes do not help because inevitably through the clusters we recreate some forms of silos. We have the urgent clusters, we have the urban transformation cluster, we have the diversity cluster and we luckily we circulate across them but sometimes because of lack of time and because of our multiple pulls we are not always able to uh, to, to show that sort of interdisciplinarity, this pluridisciplinarity, this multi cross transdisciplinarity, where which we need which we need to do if we're going to be really uh, serious about the, the kind of work that we're doing. So I think it's a very very good call for us to sort of remind us what is you know what is it in the cluster that we're doing that is it really fundamental um, and probably a, a call to constantly reinject our conversations across clusters and not just within yeah. clusters. Yeah. Michael. Um, I will still argue, uh, after 40 years, that um, there is a danger in going on and on and on talking about planning. Because I think in terms of the practical interests and interventions that the DPU is involved with, um, I don't actually believe people do planning. What they do is a series of plannings in the plural. And one of the most um, uh, significant um, developments within the DPU and its impact on the world is actually to look at the variety of plannings which the DPU and its uh, programs and its staff and so on have actually been involved in evolving over the 40 or even the 60 years that we are uh, talking about and also um, projecting into the future. Uh, and I think there's an enormously rich agenda of crossing boundaries between the different plannings, in the plural, uh, that we actually have uh, when people sit in offices with uh, doors and, and plots on their doors, telling people what kind, of, what kind of planning they are supposed to be doing. Uh, and what's one of the things that, that intellectually, uh, as well as professionally, I think uh, really does still uh, lack the kind of incisive definition and comparison which uh, I believe it, it deserves. Secondly, um, I think that in the question of the future, uh, again, I suggest that as with um, the history of planning evolution, evolution, we also need to think rather, rather seriously about the stark uh, what should I call it, the stark uh, context which we are, which we are moving into. Um, my own sort of uh, formation, uh, which was basically in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s, was, looking back at it now, one of immense promise uh, which was being explored at various different levels uh, in a world that was, to some degree, 
uh, after the uh, Second World War, uh, emerging into a phase of not only uh, development, but also of uh, the, the idea that people could actually begin to look forward to a kind of uh, life, uh, of everyday life, of, of uh, institutional uh, development, so on, that was, that was relatively po positive, if not radical, uh, and there was a sense that actually we were living uh, in relatively, not only uh, interesting, but also progressive times. The last 40 years, or the last 30 years, that has largely been dissipated. And I would argue that we are now, we have been, and you have been living your lives in a much darker uh, context than I and my more privileged um, predecessors. That if you look at the world from 1979, 1980, uh, until now, and what we see is all over the world in different forms a very much more challenging uh, existence for all of us and all of our institutions um, within the sort of general context of the global and the global south and whatever else you want to put into the equation. And I would say that actually there are very fundamental uh, questions about um, transformation regarding, for example, the very uh, viability of the modern sovereign national state system in the world and its actual ability to deal with many of the issues that we have been sorry, we have been uh, looking at you have been discussing uh, in all the aspects of the agenda that we have been working on and I really think that actually there are some very uh, significant uh, boundary crossings to be made in matters which are have a medium a medium uh, scale a medium uh, history uh, let's say till 20 25 2050 um, where even before we finally blow up the world in terms of climate change <coughs> and so on we may well be facing blowing up the world in other equally uh, dismal ways uh, unless we really can get some sort of uh, practical uh, achievement relating to the kinds of issues that we've been discussing this afternoon. Thank you, Michael. That's um, that's um, un uncharacteristically pessimistic coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> but a, but a, but a wonderful challenge to end up with with your you long experience, uh, and it's one that I throw back at the the younger generations uh, for the next sixty years. So thank you all very much. Thank you, David. Thank you to my four colleagues. Um, I forgot to thank specifically Matt uh, and Chris, who have been fantastically helpful uh, throughout the year uh, in the DPU 60 celebrations, um, the DPU news, and you know, all sorts of outputs, and all my colleagues who worked extremely hard. So um, Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, and I wish you all an excellent 2015. 61 years of DPU. We're not going to celebrate it. It's not worth it. Uh, and um, thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.